pigs don't have fur to keep them warm, as many animals do. Instead, there's a layer of fat just beneath the skin, which acts as their heat insulator, as you'll know if you've ever looked at slices of roast pork. You can see the fat on the outside. Rabbits, which do have fur to prevent them losing body heat, don't have that thick layer of fat just beneath the skin. Look at this cooked rabbit meat, no outer rim of fat. Birds have feathers instead of fur to keep them warm, which is why, again, there's practically no fat around chicken either. We're not furry animals, and we don't have feathers, so we need that layer of fat, called subcutaneous fat, just beneath our skin to help keep our body heat. It can be measured like this. Our fat layer keeps us warm under many circumstances. But if we're exposed to really cold conditions, even with clothing, it might not be able to cope. As we get colder, our blood retreats away from the surface of the skin. Our extremities chill, but the vital organs inside our bodies are kept warm. That's why we should keep still in conditions of prolonged cold. If we move to try to keep warm, this causes the blood to flow outwards again to serve the muscles. The blood then gets chilled where it flows near the surface and returns to cool down our internal organs. They cannot then work properly, we collapse and we may well die. That's one reason why, if we're likely to be in the cold sea, say, for some time, we mustn't do this. Keeping still will help us stay alive longer. Whenever we're likely to experience prolonged cold, we must be properly equipped to face it, and we must remember how to behave, to seek shelter and remain still if we get lost at night or have an accident. Tiny babies, such as this premature baby, can lose heat very easily. That's why they must be kept warm artificially in incubators such as this until they grow a little and are able to maintain their body heat. It's called hypothermia when the body loses heat. Small babies and elderly people are at great risk if they aren't kept warm. <laughs> There are thin metal foil survival blankets like this, which can be wrapped around anyone who might be suffering from hypothermia to stop heat loss. There's a shiny reflecting surface inside and out, and this keeps body heat in. Here's a model showing a highly magnified section of human skin. These yellow patches are the fat in the heat insulating layer. This is a sweat gland. Sweat passes along this duct to the surface of the skin. The right hand side of the model represents part of the skin where there aren't any hairs, such as the fingertip. Here's another sweat duct. Here, greatly magnified, are parts of the ridges which form our fingerprints and tiny outlets for the sweat. If you look closely at the fingertips, you can see tiny droplets of sweat at some of those little outlets. The skin's always secreting some moisture like this. If we get too hot, we perspire more, and the sweat evaporating at the surface of the skin helps cool us down, so our skin both keeps us warm and can also, through the sweat mechanism, cool us down. Each of these jars holds five litres. Ten litres, the contents of both jars, is the volume of sweat a man loses during a hard day's work under hot conditions. It contains 30 grams of salt, that's why people must take salt tablets in very hot environments, because salt is an essential constituent of our body fluids. Here's part of the skin with hairs. 
these grow out of hair follicles. Here's one. This is the tiny muscle which can make our hairs stand on end. And the hairs are also connected with nerves which carry signals to the brain when the hairs are touched. There are also nerves which give the skin itself the sense of touch. These nerve endings send signals to the sensory area of the brain when the skin above is pressed through touching something. Now, nerve cells, like all living cells, must have a blood supply. The more nerves, the better the blood supply. Here are the blood vessels of a newborn baby. Look at the fingertips. There's a concentration of blood vessels at each tip. This is because there are many nerve endings at the fingertips which are very sensitive. Into the pen and pots of Someone like this boy, who has been blind since birth, can with practice really use the sensitive areas of his fingertips to distinguish the small raised characters of the Braille alphabet. And I put seashells with sea animals. Now for an experiment which shows us something else about our skin. It carries bacteria, those tiny single-celled organisms invisible to the naked eye, some of which are necessary to us, but some definitely not. He's pressing onto a gel which contains substances which bacteria can feed on. The bacteria, transferred from his skin to the gel, are too small to see. But if the plate containing the gel is kept at the right temperature for 12 hours or so, each individual bacterium will multiply, forming a colony of many thousands. The colony will be large enough to be visible. If there's a number of bacteria, each will multiply to form a colony we can see. Let's look at the plate he pressed his fingers on after it's been incubated. You can see many colonies of bacteria, showing that there must have been hundreds of bacteria on each fingertip. Now he's washing his hands really thoroughly, and he'll dry them on a clean paper towel, not on a used towel, which may already be carrying a large number of bacteria. This time you can see that there were far fewer bacteria on his fingers, less than about 10 on each, since only about 10 colonies have grown on each fingerprint. These are all harmless bacteria. Here's a culture of another harmless bacterium growing on a plate of the gel. It's a useful one because it's coloured and the colonies can be seen easily. He puts a single sheet of ordinary toilet paper on top, then gently presses down. Do you think any bacteria will get through the paper onto his skin? If they have, they're too few to see. So he presses his fingers onto a clean plate of the nutrient gel, gel containing food for the bacteria and it goes into the incubator. Twelve hours later. It's quite obvious that there must have been many hundreds of bacteria on each fingertip, each of which has multiplied to produce one of these visible colonies. Suppose he makes it three thicknesses of the toilet paper. Onto a fresh culture plate. And many bacteria had still penetrated the three layers of paper and got onto his skin. This shows how important it is to wash your hands properly after using the lavatory two layers of paper. Then, without washing, he shakes hands with someone else. Let's see if he's passed bacteria to the other person's skin. He certainly has. Now, suppose this second person shakes hands with a third. Does he pass bacteria onto this third person? Yes, he does. In fact, the bacteria from the first man's hand can be transmitted to six or seven others in this way. 
These are the colonies from a seventh person's hands. These are harmless bacteria. But suppose someone had a disease with harmful bacteria in his feces. You can see how important it is to wash your hands. Damaged skin. Suppose this was a burn or scald. There's one vital first aid procedure for all burns and scalds, plenty of cold water to take away the heat as rapidly as possible. This reduces the pain and the damage to the skin. It's even more important when the burn or scald affects a large area of skin. Once again, cold water, not just for a few seconds, but for many minutes. Then rest until expert help arrives. If there are clothes on the burnt or scalded area, don't try to take them off. This will cause even more damage to the skin and delay the time before the injury can be cooled down. Cold water again as quickly as possible. The dangers from a bad burn or scald are that the body loses fluid through the damaged skin, which causes serious shock. And bacteria can enter the body through the wound and cause infection. Hospital treatment is necessary for bad burns and scalds. In this burns unit, everything is very clean to prevent infection. The air is filtered to keep out bacteria. Under these conditions, skin often heals satisfactorily. If the burn or scald isn't too deep, new skin will form. This burnt arm is recovering nicely. New skin is growing. But a deep burn or scald destroys the part which makes new skin, and a skin graft is necessary to cover the wounded area. The patient needs a supply of new blood to replace that lost from the wound during the operation. A very thin layer of skin is taken from a healthy area, so thin that new skin will form to replace it in a week or two. This thin layer of good skin is mounted on gauze with the outside downwards. It's then applied over the wounded area and the gauze is taken off. The skin quickly takes, fed by the body's blood supply. It has to be firmly bandaged for a time and so does the area from which it was taken. This girl's arm was severely burned. Skin was taken from her leg. Here and applied to the wound. It's taken, and while she'll have some scars, the result will be very good in the end. You must know the right first aid, cold water for burns and scalds. Better still, you must try to make sure that these terrible accidents don't happen. Maybe one day to your children.